Before we get to the movie, I have a really good idea for a web series. Hmm. It's called Denzel Washington Reads a Book. <laughs> Denzel Washington sits down in a chair, he picks up a book, and he reads it. That's got to be an exciting book, like mm -hmm. a Tom Clancy novel or <laughs> an Agatha Christie mystery. Yes. Each episode is 10 minutes long exactly. And most of it is just silence. It's just watching Denzel Washington read a book. Oh, he's not reading it out loud. No, he's oh. just reading it. Mm -hmm. But then every once in a while, you get just like a, oh, <laughs> I did not see that coming. Mm. <laughs> Doing that lip thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If such a series existed, I would watch every one and I wouldn't fast forward through it. When I was in college, I figured out that the man I most wanted to look like was Denzel Washington. I knew it was never going to happen. I wanted his face in Barishnikov's body. As you can see, I've succeeded. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. We have not had a lot of movies by female directors on this show. Tonight, we are going to add one more. If big city life has got you down, all you need to do is take a short bus trip out to suburbia. Oh! I heard about this movie all the time back in the 80s, and it felt like something for cool kids to watch. Released in 1983, Suburbia was directed by Basement alum Penelope Spheris. Welcome back, Penelope. And produced by Roger Corman and New World Pictures. It stars Bill Coyne, Chris Peterson, Jennifer Clay, and for his third appearance on our show, Flea! <laughs> He's billed in this as Mike B. the Flea. With the exception of the two male leads, Spheris didn't want to cast actors, so she recruited street kids and punk rock musicians to play all of the supporting roles, which is kind of her thing. Now, this is not to be confused with the 1996 Richard Linklater film, Suburbia. That was not a remake of this film, that was an adaptation of a play by Eric Bogosian. This film inspired the 1986 Pet Shop Boys song, Suburbia. Tonight's gift is the bane of any suburban house owner. Radon? Ah! Mice! Read what it says on the package. Frightened loved ones with this pair of rude rodents. Oh, they're rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're wearing that. <laughs> well, get away from the hustle and bustle and come on over to the gated community that is the old leather couch as we watch Suburbia. Eek, eek. Eek. A young woman is out by the highway, hitchhiking. You gotta raise that thumb up higher if you expect to get a ride, lady. You can't do lackadaisical hitchhiking and expect <laughs> results. She's picked up by this nice young mother and her child. They get a flat tire. Ha 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 ha! Blow out! <laughs> and so they have to walk to the nearest phone booth, which is in this desolate wasteland. Look at all those cars. They all have wheels that work. You'll grow up to be disappointed in your mommy. And there's this dog. Give me snossages! And it doesn't end well for the kid. Whoa. What the living hell? It's suburbia! That was a little punk rock song that we saw. Jenny was a hitcher on the I-90-10. <laughs> I-90-10, punk rock mathematics. <laughs> Anthony's at home reading his comic book. Evan! Boy, don't scream like that. Scream like this! Well, I didn't drink it. You're lying to me. Ever have one of those days when your mom is Kathy Bates? God damn you! I told you to throw out this trash this morning! You're gonna attract mice! Anthony's had it with her, and he leaves. He says goodbye to his kid brother. I'm going away for a while. Mom's having a hard time right now. If she only has one kid to vent her rage on, she'll be able to do it a lot more efficiently. <laughs> I wish I could get a Grand Slam special. I wish I could afford a Moons over my hammy. <laughs> Anthony's out there on the streets. He's got nothing but a trash bag full of crap. What's he going to do? He's going to go to a punk rock concert. Come on. That man is the lead singer of the band The Winers. In the punk club, there's some punking going on. The Executioner's Curtain Call. Odin, 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 Odin. That's a little Penelope Spears shout out for you. <laughs> there is an incident. <laughs> and the place has to be shut down for the night. Anthony's dosed by some guy. And he ends up laying on the floor. He's tossed out of the club. He's picked up by Jack. 
You need a lift home? I can't go home. I'm like that frog that doesn't have a home. In that song. Yeah, funny song about the frog who does who's homeless. Yeah. Go on, tell me more about yeah. this song, Matt. I believe it's Clarence Frogman yeah. Carter. <laughs> You know the song I'm talking about. You've heard it. Hey, we got this house. It's called TR. We live there for free because it's abandoned. You can come live with us if you want. Anthony says, I got nothing else going on. Okay, let's pick up our friend Joe. I've heard of manual transmissions, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> Joe's dad has a male lover, and he doesn't like that. So he's more than happy to move out. On their way out to TR, they see these packs of wild dogs. They're everywhere. I heard they killed this kid the other day. Oh my god! This reminds me of that Stephen King novel, Firestarter! And they go to TR, their squat. Here's where we meet the gang. Sheila the Hitchhiker is there. Razzle. Keith, who likes to do drugs. Tom Skinner. TR stands for The Rejected. And they've got a special heat and iron that they burn those initials into their skin with. Joe says, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm leaving. Watch out for the dogs. Joe leaves. If you're going to hitchhike, you got to do classic Looney Tunes hitchhiking where you go. <laughs> Dad, let me in. It's me. Me's not here, man. Joe comes back. I'm back. And he has a heart to heart with Sheila. Sheila's got all these scars on her back, but she doesn't want to talk about that right now. The kids are woken by gunfire. These couple of good old boys have got their guns. They heard about the dog attacking that kid, so they're going to come down and take care of the dogs. The punks go out and they manage to save two of them, and then the cops show up. Officer Renard is there. He's Jack's stepfather. you got to look at that TR house. There's a bunch of punks living there. Let me worry about that. You guys get out of here. Oh, you were with GM. Twelve long years. So are these three street kids or punk rock musicians? I can't tell. Some of the boys go out to rob garages. This is how they get the food. They stop by this nice yard sale. This will not end well. And they talk to this nice lady and they ask her a nasty question. Got any vibrators? Well, I only have four. <laughs> so it's not much of a selection. Well, at least there was no violence there. Just a bit of performance <laughs> art. <laughs> Well, they got all this food that they burgled. Let's have a cookout. They drink a lot of beer. D, guess what? What? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. I know. <laughs> this place is great. I'm going to go get my little brother and bring him here so he can get away from my crazy mother. The little boy's name is Ethan. He gets a mohawk haircut because that is on brand for the lifestyle of these kids. <laughs> Looking for somebody else, but there is only loneliness to find. <laughs> Joe and Sheila are an item now. Tell me now. Tell you what? Chicken butt. My dad used to beat me. He also used to molest me. And that's why I left home. Cool, man. I think the lead singers are really Hey, yeah, it's real. I'm looking forward to our night out, yeah, guys. Gonna, it's gonna oh, yeah, be a lot of, uh, Hey, I'm driving a, a car concert. right now. Guys. You like punk rock? Here's TSOL. This guy's like the Elvis of punk rock. He's got a thing going. Flea is making sure everyone has an uplift mofo party plan. <laughs> Skinner goes out for a walk. And he gets tormented by these two squares. They beat him up. And this isn't the Skinner I know. Luckily, all of Skinner's friends show up and they beat up the guys. That's enough of this! Get away from my house! <laughs> It's old man McGillicuddy! Well, they go back into the club, have a good time, but those two guys show up with their knife and they stab a security guard. Will they never see the end of a punk show? Show's over. Moving on to Santa Barbara. See you in Santa Barbara tomorrow, guys. It's an all ages, all stabbing show, uh, so we hope you can make it. You know, Flea asked to do that. That was not asked of him. <laughs> Come down to J Market. They've got the best prices in town. Unless you're a punk. Because they don't want your business. Right, wise guy. Just get the hell out before I call the police. What a character. Well, I wouldn't call him that great of a character. <laughs> and they definitely don't want you going in there messing up the eggs. Happy Easter, asshole. <laughs> what they did isn't a crime. You're preventing people from eating pickled eggs. Yeah, I like pickled eggs. There's a community meeting, Citizens versus Crime, and they've got a TR problem. These punks have got to go, and the police aren't doing enough. The people have to protect themselves. 
and resort to vigilantes as he... You can find reruns of Cabaret Hollywood on YouTube. It's pretty much just that. Just girls. <laughs> You're a cop. Yes, I am. But that's not the reason why I'm here to talk to you. It's the reason I'm here to arrest you. You kids are making a pretty bad reputation for yourselves. I've heard that you don't give a damn about your bad reputation. <laughs> I think it's best for all of you to go back to your homes until this thing blows over. Most of us don't have homes to go back to. We're like the frog in the song that doesn't have a home. <laughs> doesn't have a fan base. That sucks big eggs. Blue eggs, like we did back at the store. College? Most of us couldn't afford lunch in high school. Skinner has the vocal cadence of a Peanuts character. The two townie dudes sneak into TR late at night. Let's get up to some vigilantics. <laughs> They grab Sheila. You gotta get out of this house, you, you bums. Next time, we're not gonna be so nice. The next day, everybody's pissed off. Did you see my shirt? Skinner's looking for his shirt. My yellow shirt. He's looking all over the place. Can't find my fucking shirt. Nobody has his shirt. Now I can't find my goddamn shirt. He can't find it. Where's my shirt? I guess I'll have to go with the puce one today. But he finds Sheila, and Sheila's not alive anymore. It's just like that Black Flag album cover. She took Keith's pills and overdosed. To my friends, don't be mad at me for doing this. The time I have lived with you is the best part of my life. Gone forever, Sheila. P.S. I stole the yellow shirt. <laughs> they don't know what to do with a dead body. So they take Sheila's body home to her parents' house. At the funeral, they are asked to leave. And havoc ensues. <clears throat> the kids make a run for it. Very purging, wasn't it? Got a lot of emotions out there. Run! <laughs> Again with a punk concert. I believe this is the Vandals. All across the city of Los Angeles, pumps are not working because of this van. <laughs> Renard comes by in his cruiser. He tells Jack that he needs to leave TR. I want you out tonight. It's time for us to leave. We gotta go. Be sure to pack up all the scraps and the filth. <laughs> Bring one male and female cockroach so they can start up a new race at the new squat. <laughs> Don't you think we really ought to trash this place before we leave? By straightening up a bit. <laughs> Cle cleaning up is actually trashing it more. So the TV for starters. Like sourdough starters. <laughs> Razzle says, I'm going to get some gas out of the car. We'll set the whole place on fire. It's like that Stephen King novel, Cujo. Then Jack suddenly realizes, we're going to stay. No one's going to make us leave our home. Got a match? Save it, Razzle. We're staying. Staying? How are we going to leave there after I burn the place down? Oh, I get it. You don't want me to burn the place down. Well, I guess Razzle doesn't have any fun again. <laughs> the two tiny dudes are at the Kit Kat stripping club. Did you hear those punks broke into this funeral and raised hell? We gotta go out there and get them. They sneak out there late at night. We're gonna fight it to get out. But the punks are ready for them. They sick the dogs on them. There's this big fight. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. And the townies are driven off. It seems. They turn the car around and they're gonna ram everybody. Everyone gets out of the way except for little Ethan who is killed. That's all that's left of suburbia. That was a good movie. I don't feel, excuse me, I, uh... <laughs> no, 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 man. Let, let you, me. You, you do, do mine. This, you have, any, yeah. you have anything sharper than these pens? I thought this was a comedy. <laughs> I don't do a lot of research in these movies, folks. Did you think it because Penelope, Penelope Spheris directed it and she went on to Wayne's World? I think she directed a film called Dudes, which was about these punk rockers in Texas or something. And that was a comedy. So I thought this was like that. It's not. No, it's not. Penelope Spheris does a pretty neat trick here. In the first half of the movie, these protagonists are really not protagonists that you like at all. No, they're vile. It gets to the point when the two townies jump out at Skinner. I was thinking, oh good, Skinner's going to get his ass kicked. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad the protagonist is getting beat up. Mm -hmm. And that's a weird thing 
to think in a movie. But then she very subtly turns it around and Mm -hmm. then she starts to show the humanity of these kids. They're products of broken homes Mm -hmm. and economic disparity and abuse and neglect and things like that. And from growing up under the shadow of a mushroom cloud. Which doesn't excuse their behavior, but it explains their behavior. Yes. They want to live this life that gives them some modicum of satisfaction. Yes. Or around people like them so they don't feel as though they're outcasts every moment of their life. So by by the end of the movie, these people that you despised at the beginning of the movie, you're kind of pulling for them. Well, the big turnaround comes with the death of Sheila. Yeah. And of course, she is the last one you want to see die, other than the kid. They deserve to be at the funeral, really. They deserve to be there more than the father does. Yes. And also just that weird confusion. We can't call the cops. Yeah. The movie's very even-handed about the normal people. Even the villains aren't particularly villainous. Mm -hmm. They're just these dopes who feel like they need to step in. Yeah. They're not like, we're going to go out and get them because we like killing kids or, you know, things like that. They like killing dogs. But of course, the dogs are the kids and Mm -hmm. the kids are the dogs. Yes. And the dogs are products of their environment, Mm -hmm. too, from being abandoned and neglected and left to roam free. Why does Spheris pull that off? I think it's because she had immersed herself in this world when she made the first Rise and Fall of Western Civilization movie. Yeah. So she probably had seen kids like this. She got to know them. The whole spectrum of their behavior, good and bad. The bonds that they form and the awful things that they do. The movie really is a full portrait of being down and out in L.A. And speaking of L.A., I know that in the early 80s, parts of L.A. were pretty grim. Do you think any of this squalor was exaggerated in any way for dramatic effect? I don't remember hearing stories of packs of wild dogs roaming the streets and killing people. That neighborhood wasn't built for the film, I'm sure. A lot of this had kind of a Repo Man feel. I was thinking about Repo Man. Which is kind of a heightened reality to serve the purpose of a story. And Repo Man came out within a year of this. That is a comic version of this lifestyle. Let's talk about Flea. This is his third time showing up on our show. He does quite a bit of acting. What does Flea bring to the cinematic (laughs) table? He brings a certain feralness. Unpredictability. You don't know what this guy's going to do. He's going to do things that actors aren't supposed to do. It's almost an uncomfortable feeling. Like when you're in high school and there's the class clown, Mm -hmm. and one day the class clown just takes it too far, (laughs) and everyone stops (laughs) laughing, and everyone just wishes it would stop. That's kind of what you feel watching Fleet. I don't know who the two actual actors were. I'm pretty certain that Anthony and Sheila? No, Sheila was not uh, an actor. Uh, Penelope Spheres met Sheila in line at a Public Image Limited concert. As one does. I really like the concert footage in this. This is truly what Penelope Spheres does best. Yeah. Those three shows are all shows I wanted to be at. Except for the really horrible things happening in the audience. I'm not the biggest into the L.A. punk scene as far as my musical tastes go. But all three of those bands looked really, really fun to watch. You know, I do want to find out who the two legit actors are. I'm just going to look that up. His name was Evan. We've been calling him Anthony the whole time. (laughs) Okay, you know, Anthony that we're talking about on the couch, his name is Evan. Yeah, it is. And Jack were the two actors. Actually, I thought Joe was a better actor than Jack, and I thought Flea was a better actor than Jack. And Sheila, for that matter. Yeah, Sheila was great. The movie is very loose, and then there's that one shot. I think she wanted it to look like a classical painting. Yeah. To show the gravity of this death that has happened. Mm -hmm. It's like a classical painter commemorating the death of Christ. Do you have a punk handle that you would go by if you lived in the TR house? (laughs) Well, Razzle's already taken. What about Crage? (laughs) It's like Craig and Rage. (laughs) Matt. Mattering Ram. (laughs) All right, man. Uh, That was suburbia. (laughs) Now it's time for Seen It. Or maybe it isn't. (laughs) Seen It. Our theme for Seen It today is Mail Crate. These are DVDs that were sent in to us by our viewers. We watched a Roger Corman produced movie tonight. Here's a Roger Corman directed the directed movie, The Intruder. Bill Shatner, seen it. Seen it. I watched this right after January 6th. <laughs> and everything that happens in this movie happened in D.C. on that day. Yep. The parallels are chilling. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get into these details because I don't want to get pissed off. I just want to talk about The Intruder. This movie's like the music man for racists. 
where this huckster shows up in town. You know what's wrong with this world? It starts with an I and it ends with an N and it's integration. This is undoubtedly Roger Corman's best movie. And it's not exploitation. No. It's a movie about rationality versus irrationality and about how one's respect for the law should supersede one's personal opinions. The hero of this movie is a racist. Mm -hmm. He says so at the beginning. He says, I don't like integration, but it's the law and I follow the law. It, this feels like a Twilight Zone episode without a supernatural element to it. And that's not a coincidence because Charles Beaumont, who was a regular writer on the Twilight Zone, wrote this as well. And if you want to hear Captain Kirk drop the N-bomb about two dozen times, this is the movie for you. Next up, we've got The Castle. You little ripper! <laughs> Seen it! Seen it. This is an Australian classic. This was sent to us by our good friends, uh, Therese and Company, down there, down under. Mm -hmm. And this is a very charming movie of likable dolts. This movie wins you over. The family wins you over because of their optimism and because yeah. of their love for each other. Definitely. It's a classic story of... Compulsory acquisition, otherwise known in the States as eminent domain. They have the worst house in Australia, and it's being taken away from them by the government. And they right. won't stand for it. I saw a quote from Ebert saying that this was 1997's The Full Monty, and I don't agree with that at all. No. I, this is closer to Raising Arizona. Because every character is a caricature with a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And it's not nearly as cartoonish as that, but it's as exaggerated as that. Yes. The movie's 25 years old. It's from a different culture. Those are some big gulfs to transcend. Uh, nevertheless, I found this movie to be fair dinkum. We've had the Aussies, but you know who's coming? The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Seen it. Seen it. We have a comedy all-star cast. Carl Reiner in a lead performance. The first 25 minutes of this movie are brilliant. These Russians have landed on U.S. soil accidentally and they're sneaking around and trying to be on the DL and encountering this weird family. Yeah. Now, once news of the Russians gets out, the movie becomes a small town panic film. Yeah. And I kind of don't like that because I don't like movies where people are constantly screaming and shouting at each other. You know this about me, Craig. But you love a mad, 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 mad world. A mad, mad world <laughs> did it right. This okay. movie doesn't quite nail it. During the panic. Anytime anyone says a statement to anyone else, they respond by either shouting the statement back at that person <laughs> or going, what? The bulk of the movie does not live up to the first part of the movie. Lastly, we've got The Last Starfighter. Seen it a whole lot of times. Seen it a whole lot of times. The writing in this movie is atrocious. And the plot is ridiculous. <laughs> and there is not one plausible moment in the entire movie. But the movie is so much fun, you don't care. Yeah. Has there ever been a trailer park that's just this wonderful to hang out in? Yes, the one he lives in, The Last Starfighter. Even the special effects, which have not aged well, they no. look like video game effects, mm -hmm. so it kind of works, even today. And this movie features Catherine Mary Stewart, who played BB in The Apple. There's a place that you can go hang out with that's not full of squalor, but it is full of good times and camaraderie, and that's our website. Welcome to the basement show.com. You can see all of our websites there <laughs> in order. Websites? You can see all of our episodes <laughs> in order or out of order. Do what you want. And there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on to donate to help support our show with a one time or rolling monthly donation. You should do it because pretty punk. One of our donors is Melinda, who says, Love this show. Keep it up. Two movies that I think you'd have a lot of fun watching are Strictly Ballroom and Bride and Prejudice. They're both international films. Definitely can be, but a lot of fun. Someone sent us Strictly Ballroom. It's on my shelf over there, and I am sure I will get around to it eventually. Yes. If you want to see more of us yakking away, you can watch Unboxing, which comes up this coming Friday. We open our mail. We read viewer comments. In the comments of this video, you can ask us questions. You can give us scenic suggestions. You can go to our Facebook page and like that, too. Well, suburbia is over. It was a long walk. Thanks for taking that journey with us. And now take a look at this. Hey, Matt, I'm really liking these movies so far. Matt, I like the movie. Yeah. So far! Watch out for the dogs.